Hello, beautiful people. If you're new here, my name is Amanda Zitto, and I have had the absolute pleasure of getting to borrow this 2022 Honda Africa Twin Adventure Sport ES DCT from Honda America for the summer. I've put 10,000 miles on this motorcycle in the span of four months, from freezing temperatures to 103 degree heat. Before we dive into my review and the technical specs of this beautiful motorcycle, I wanna give you some context. I am a Honda fangirl and I'm very proud of it. I own three beautiful Hondas myself. I have dreamed of owning the Africa Twin since its reintroduction in 2016 and settled on the CB500X for the lower price point and still boasting that smaller parallel twin engine. So for me, getting to spend a whole summer on this Africa Twin has been an absolute dream and I can tell you upfront that it has met all of my expectations. All of that being said, I'm going to do my best to break down the technical specs of this motorcycle and also the pros and cons that I have experienced over the last 10,000 miles. So there's technically four different models of the 2022 Africa Twin lineup. The main difference between all these bikes being the weight of the bike itself, the gas tank size, and the kind of transmission that it comes with, along with a couple different accessories that only comes with the Adventure Sport lineup to make that just a little bit more premium than the standard model. That broken down, let's go over some of the technical specs of this motorcycle, and then I'll talk to you about my personal experience riding this bike. This bike has a 1,084cc liquid-cooled, fuel-injected, four-stroke Unicam parallel twin engine. It is chain driven, which comes standard with a 16 tooth front sprocket and a 42 tooth rear sprocket. It has Showa EERA electronic suspension, 45 millimeter inverted telescopic front forks with 9.1 inches of travel, and a ProLink system single rear shock with 8.7 inches of travel. ABS and traction control, which can be turned off, two four piston hydraulic caliper front brakes with 310 millimeter discs and a single one piston hydraulic caliper rear brake with a 256 millimeter disc. Tubeless tires, 21 inch front tire, and a 18 inch rear with a wheelbase of 62 inches. Standard seat height is 34.3 inches. With the adjustable seat set to the low position, it is 33.5 inches. I am five foot seven inches tall with an inseam of about 31 inches. I cannot flat foot both sides of this motorcycle, even with the seat in the low position and all of the weight on the back of the bike. Because of the electronic suspension, I'm able to adjust the suspension to accommodate all of the luggage on the back of my bike. All of this means that I do have to be a little bit more picky about where I park the bike and what kind of incline it's gonna be on if I am just gonna use my momentum to get it off the kickstand. Alternatively, I have just learned to center the bike upright before I get on it and then high kick over the seat. And that has really how I get on the bike now. <laughs> so even if I'm in a situation where I do have to park the bike with the kickstand a little bit more on an incline than I would like, I can still get the bike up off the kickstand, no problem. It does take a little bit of practice, but I wouldn't say that the seat height is prohibitive or a reason that I personally would not purchase this motorcycle. 551 pounds wet with a six and a half gallon gas tank with a one gallon reserve does make this the heaviest choice in the Africa Twin lineup. Yes, you can absolutely feel the weight of the gas in the gas tank when the gas is full for sure. And especially when you do anything slow speeds or moving the bike around by hand. However, I will say that even with the six and a half gallon tank, one gallon reserve, this bike still has a lower center of gravity than my Tiger did. <laughs> I also just find this bike more comfortable for me personally than the Pan America or the Triumph Explorer. I did mention earlier that this is the version that comes with the six speed dual clutch transmission, also known as DCT. What I've seen others be confused about with the DCT, thinking that it's just straight and automatic, is that you don't have any control over what gear you're in, which is not true. There are five different drive modes from fully automatic to Sport 1, Sport 2, and Sport 3, as well as a full manual mode where you control what gear you're in with the bumpers on the left-hand side of the handlebars. You still have engine compression braking. The main difference is that you no longer have a clutch, <laughs> which we'll talk more about later. A six and a half inch TFT display with a whole range of menus and options cruise control, which is set by these buttons, 
heated grips with five different levels, adjustable windscreen, a 12 volt accessory socket, cornering lights, which are amazing by the way, when you're going over a mountain pass in the dark, throttle by wire, and an aluminum rear luggage carrier. Okay, technical specs out of the way. I just need to say that when I get on this motorcycle, I feel like I can ride to Texas and back. I love it so much. <laughs> on a superficial front, I think this bike is gorgeous. Obviously those things are totally subjective, but I will say that even on like super long trips, if this bike was parked somewhere for more than a couple minutes, I had people coming up to me asking me, about the bike specifically. Most of the time people see me and they're like, oh, there's a bunch of luggage on your bike, tell me where you're going. They don't really ask me about my motorcycle. With the Africa Twin, they were asking me about the motorcycle. <laughs> they didn't care where I was going. <laughs> I did do a thousand miles in 24 hours back in June. I did a whole video about that and it was remarkable how easy it was to do a super long day like this on this bike. Of course, at the end, you just get tired from fatigue, it's inevitable. But I blasted past my personal record on the CB Fettered X and way past where I would have been exhausted on a smaller motorcycle. While I did a lot of long mileage days, a lot of long mileage trips on this motorcycle this summer, and I definitely would say that I didn't experience as much fatigue as I normally would have, I will say that after about mile 300, uh, in one day, the seat starts to feel like concrete. <laughs> Which, you know, it's just a sign that you need to stop and stretch anyway, but it doesn't get better after that. <laughs> For context, I've been running the stock seat on the CB100X the whole time that I've owned it. I've never put a custom or a different kind of seat on the CB, and I've been absolutely fine. This was a different experience. <laughs> I think the main difference being that the foam in this seat leans more towards that hard foam that you find on dirt bikes and less towards that softer gel kind of foam that you find in seats on adventure bikes that are made more for touring. The sitting position on this bike feels very natural to me. The iron butt challenge aside, I did do multiple 600 mile days on this motorcycle. It just sings as a long distance bike. <laughs> I am shorter than most people that find this bike really comfortable and I did find a little bit of tension in my shoulders at the end of super long days from just a little bit more reaching for the bars than taller people would experience on this bike, but that would be easily fixed by just shifting the bars more towards me um, in the clamps or alternatively adding a small riser so that I could also just shift the bars back towards me just a little bit. It doesn't have to be a huge amount to make a big difference in the tension that I'm feeling in my shoulders just because I'm reaching just a little bit too far. That being said, I haven't experienced any of the lower back pain or the buzzing in my hands that I have gotten from other motorcycles on long mile days. Okay, there's no getting around it. There is a lot of stuff going on with the dash on this bike. The first few days that I had this motorcycle, I was much more focused on getting accustomed to the size and weight than I was about playing with ride modes. So when I died into settings, it was a whole other ball game. It can definitely be a lot if you're not accustomed to having a display and a bike with so many different kinds of ride modes and settings. So I did find that Honda had a simulator for their display that made it much easier for me to like learn what everything did without having to stand in my garage and drain my battery trying to learn what everything does. And also the simulator has explanations for what some of the stuff is that may not be totally obvious at first. I'll link the Honda simulator down in the description if you think that it might be helpful for you. There are three different style of displays depending on how much information you want to see at once and a couple of different drive modes from off-road, gravel, touring, urban, and two different user settings. You can select your load and whether you're riding two up or solo so the electronic suspension automatically adjusts. You can also turn on and off traction control and ABS. I had a hit and miss experience using Android Auto with this bike. I have since gotten a newer phone and while it does work a bit better, I'm still experiencing some glitches where sometimes Android Auto will crash and I will have to stop to re-engage Android Auto. 
Although talking to other people, they have had a much more seamless experience using Android Auto than I have had, as well as people who absolutely love using Apple CarPlay with it. Problems with Android Auto crashing aside, my main nitpick about the system is that in order to use Android Auto, your phone has to be connected to the USB port, right? But you can't use just the USB port to charge your device without running Android Auto. And I just wish it was just a little bit easier to make it so that it wouldn't automatically switch to Android Auto whenever you had your phone plugged into that USB port. Of course, there is always the 12 volt um, that you can get an accessory to use as a USB port. Be very cautious with the 12 volt. I did blow the fuse. When it says two amp max, it means it. So that uh, 12 volt plug is not going to charge your drone batteries. <laughs> For people who haven't gotten to ride a DCT before, think about it kind of like a recluse clutch. It's there to assist with hill climbs so that you're not killing the bike in the middle of a hill or worrying about what gear you're in in the middle of a climb or killing your bike at stop signs or those kinds of things. Also, if you ride with a passenger, you're not going to knock heads when you shift gears either. <laughs> I also think a lot of people end up with a negative opinion about DCT after they ride one for the first time because they don't get told about the different ride modes. So if you do get an opportunity to ride a DCT like on a demo or something like that, do not ride it in standard automatic mode. I think that is the worst way to experience DCT for the first time. Either use the manual mode or set it in like sport one or two. I think two for me personally is the most optimal way to use the DCT drive modes because it shifts when I would normally shift. I feel like automatic wants to get you up into the highest gear as fast as possible to optimize gas fuel mileage or at least that's how I'm understanding it. I could totally be wrong. You're getting my opinion here. <laughs> also, I think it should be known that even in like the sports modes, you can still hit the bumpers to have control over what gear you're in. So if you come to a stop and it's not shifting down as fast as you think it should, you can hit the bumper to shift down. Or if you're speeding up to get on the highway and it's not shifting fast enough for you, you can, you can click the bumper to shift up. The biggest drawback in my personal opinion when thinking about owning a DCT for a longer period of time is the lack of clutch control when I want it for slow speed stuff. Especially if you're used to feathering a clutch off-road when you're in more sticky situations. I found myself over the period of the summer compensating for that lack of feathering the clutch ability by dragging brakes instead. While I haven't noticed any significant change in how fast I'm going through brake pads, and I have gone through two different services on this bike already, I am very curious long-term how me compensating for the lack of clutch by dragging brake instead would affect the long-term life of my brake pads. <laughs> Alternatively though, it was very fun to experience the DCT in gravel. It was really, really nice not to have to think about what gear I was in riding trails in South Dakota. Of course, having the adjustable suspension and the narrower front 21 wheel, I know that a lot of people are gonna ask me this. Yes, it was nicer to ride this off-road than my CB. A lot of that has to do with this bike being much more purpose-built to do those things than my CB is especially my model of CB being from 2016 before all of the tire and suspension changes that happened on those 2019 and newer models. The longer suspension travel, that narrower front tire definitely made this bike, oh yes, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say it. It was a lot more fun to ride this bike off-road than it is to ride my CB, okay? The t like, I'm also less worried about smashing something underneath the bike because the ground clearance is just a bit taller on this bike than it is on my CB. <sighs> okay, I'm like, I'm in love with this bike. I just, <laughs> wrapping up, I definitely got a couple questions from you guys being like, okay, you've been dreaming about this bike for so long. Does it actually meet expectations for you? And I would say a hundred percent probably a little bit more than what I was expecting, actually. <laughs> I knew that it would be more comfortable on longer miles than the CB, but I did not realize how much fatigue I was experiencing riding a smaller bike on those super long days versus riding this bike. I definitely feel like I had more energy at the end of the day. 
I didn't dread doing chores once you kind of get to your destination. You know, like at the end of a really long day when you're tired, you get to where you're going and you don't really want to do everything else you still have to do. And I still had enough energy to do all those things without dreading them at the end of the day. Which I know this sounds weird, but it's the truth. I was following my pattern of stopping about every 75 to 100 miles, depending on where the rest areas were, if there was a nice spot to stop or not. And I found myself hitting those normal break points when I would take a break on the CB and feel like I could just keep going. I didn't need to stop. Sometimes I would just drive through my whole tank of gas and then stop and take a break when I got to the gas station. I will put my average MPG and amount of miles that I got per tank up on the screen for you keeping in mind that most of the time that I rode this bike this summer, it was fully loaded with stuff in the back, plus me. So, <laughs> would I own this motorcycle? Absolutely. I've been dreaming about the Africa Twin for forever, and I still want it just as badly as I did when they reintroduced it in 2016. Would I own the DCT model? Absolutely. I had a ton of fun on this bike and would absolutely keep it in an instant if Honda would let me keep her because I have grown so attached to this bike. <laughs> if you're looking at buying one and comparing DCT to manual, I think there are definitely arguments for the manual because of the lighter weight. The transition from manual to DCT, especially off-road, like learning not, there's no clutch to feather, is definitely a learning curve there. Um, I didn't think that it was hugely detrimental. I didn't have any whiskey throttle problems or anything like that that a lot of people asked me about. I didn't have those issues even in cornering. Didn't have any of those kinds of issues with the DCT. It performs flawlessly for me. Now, am I going to buy it? And will I be owning one? Well, I don't know yet. You'll find out when I do. <laughs> That being said, I do want to send a huge, huge thank you to Honda America for making my dream absolutely come true and getting to ride this motorcycle all summer. I am so in love with this bike. <laughs> if you have any more questions that I didn't cover in this video, leave them down in the comment section and I will do my best to try to answer as many as I can. And in the meantime, guys, I am going to go ride this bike for as long as I can. I don't care that it's 37 degrees outside right now. <laughs> I'll see you later.